All right, Junkie Nation, Gorgeous George and Goes delivering for you yet again. We got another MMA superstar here with us, former UFC veteran, current PFL color commentator, Ken Flo. Kenny Florian, how you doing, my man? Good, good, good to be back with you guys. Yeah, good to have you as well. Uh, and folks, this guy's the answer to a trivia, a lot of trivia questions. Season one of The Ultimate Fighter, he was a finalist there. He uh, was a title contender in a few different weight classes, but I don't believe anyone else has ever competed in four weight classes in the UFC. And I think Ken Flo is the only one to do that. Am I right, Ken, or, or have you heard otherwise? I believe I, I believe Diego Sanchez is the only other one. Uh, I think me and Diego, both from season one, okay. man. Okay, Crazy. that would have been an obvious one for me then. Yeah, yeah I guess Di since Diego and I competed at 185, we both competed at 170, we both competed at 55, and Diego had what one or uh, no? Yeah, no. Did he have more than one at 145? I know he had at least one. Mm -hmm. But I knew uh, he had at least yeah. one. So as soon as you said it, I was like, egg on my forehead. Yeah, um, no, that's yeah. Uh, I was going to present to you guys hey, who do you think would, would have a good chance to do it now just to see if you guys had someone off the top of your head? Do you? Either one of you? Oh, man. You know, now I feel like things are so much more competitive it, yeah. it would be extremely difficult to do it in today's ufc world um geez i mean connor what has done three no yeah connor's done three, three so he's yeah. he's one away maybe maybe how about yeah. you guys i don't know those are pretty good ones because you got to have that body frame and you got to be within those weight classes where you're not taking a 15 pound jump you know mm. so uh, uh, that's difficult man i got one i got one I wasn't really that interested in your guys. I was just chomping at the bit to give you mine. Um, <laughs> Valentina Shoshenko has already defend, has already competed as a bantamweight. Yep. She's the current flyweight champion. And I asked her once, could you make 15? She said, yes, but I would despise it. But I gotcha. think if a super fight was presented, she could do it. And then, obviously, she only has to weigh 136 and a half to really technically compete as a featherweight. Would it be necessary? Probably not, but it's possible. I, but yeah, I, the current landscape, there doesn't seem to be one. And every time I hear someone go, what about Anthony Johnson? What they forget is that he did welterweight and he didn't compete at middleweight. At 85, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's he right. Yeah, that's right. He never made over. Now, are you talking about Peru's own Valentina Shevchenko? Is that, is that the mm -hmm. one you're referring to? Yeah, okay. Just making sure. Yeah. <laughs> We're claiming her. I don't Knuckles care. Knuckles there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So, Ken. I, I did want to ask, since, since we mentioned Diego's name, I was going to save it for some point, but I guess we can transition now. When Diego announced he uh, was going to be fighting for the last time, and I know you haven't fought in a decade, but Misha Tate just sprung one on us the other day. Yeah. AJ, wow. AJ's coming out of retirement after nearly four years. So after, if you've had surgeries or felt better or anything like that, if, if somebody would have called you and said, hey, man, you want to do Diego's last one and just come out for one, would, oh, would you have, like, contemplated it or was that a quick shutdown no 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 you know no I, I always wanted to compete uh when i feel like I, when i felt like i would physically be at my best uh obviously at 44 gonna be 45 later later on this year you know i, I still get a chance to train uh but my body definitely doesn't <laughs> it doesn't feel the same when i was competing in the ufc and even while i was competing in the ufc you know had had a lot of back issues and things but um it, it's enticing in that, hey, you know, I'd get a chance to uh, get one back potentially against someone who defeated me. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I'm uh, physically, uh, I'm not at, at where I would like to be. But technically and uh, mind wise, I feel like I'm a much better fighter, anyways. You know, as I, I'm wiser. Uh, but uh, I, I wish Diego the best, man. It's unbelievable that he's been competing for this long. And, uh, you know, say what you will uh, about, you know, maybe his record as of late, but as far as his willingness to fight and scrap, uh, he, he's an absolute legend, man. And, uh, I hope he, he gets this one where he gets out with the win. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then another thing I wanted to ask you, so we're going to go in reverse. We'll talk a little bit of a catch up here and then finish up with some PFL talk. Uh, season one is getting close, folks. April 23rd is when it all goes down. Lightweights and featherweights, this is where Ken Flo competed mostly. So he's the perfect guy to talk to uh, about because they have a, a great slew of fighters coming up. Um, as a former soccer player, 
not just some little joker that ran around at AYSO or whatever. You actually played collegiately. Are you kind of mad you didn't maybe take more to these calf kicks that are just destroying fools out there? Dude, well, I, I got to say this. I'm glad that I didn't take any, but uh, <laughs> I'm kind of upset that, yeah, I didn't get a chance to use them. You know, I uh, I remember, you know, even just with the occasional clash of shins and things like that, you know, um, for the most part, I, I would kind of, uh, be fine for it. You know, I, I was used to always getting hacked in the shins and things like that. Playing center midfield uh, or being more of an offensive player, you get whacked in the shin a lot. And then, you know, th through Muay Thai and uh, hitting heavy bags and different things and trying to straighten up your shins, you, you feel like, you know, you'd be okay. Um, so maybe that would have been a good technique for me. You know, um, I I'm glad I didn't get hit with it though. I mean, I it, it's changed the game significantly, you know, like guys who are trying to stay in the pocket and creep in, um, you know, who are trying to slide into boxing range and just use their hands are, are getting some serious wake up calls, man. The, I mean, the, the outside of the calf, that peroneal nerve, uh, that they've been whacking away at, um, have been compromising, you know, a, a lot of fighters out there. So it, it, it really is brutal. I remember, uh, you know, for me, I know Sean Shelby tweeted something to the effect that one of the ATT guys were kind of one of the first fighters. I forget the Brazilian fighter's name. Uh, Wilson, who was one of the Wilson Gouveia, exactly. He was right around my time. Uh, Wilson uh, was using it back in the day. I didn't remember that too much. He could very well be right. But I remember Benson Henderson, when I would train with him mm -hmm. and when I'd see him fight, he was one of the first guys using it with great success. But uh, it certainly has uh, evolved the game. Yeah. Uh, and, folks, even though he was a stud college basketball player at Boston College, I don't like his taste in uh, EPL. This is a man you house over here. <laughs> Soccer Liverpool player. Guy. You think you're a basketball player. Liverpool. It's all about Liverpool, man. Come on. George, <laughs> um, what is right. going on? How about this? I mean, one thing I can really appreciate about your career, Kenflo, was, um, you know, you were a fight finisher. And, of course, everybody remembers I finished fights and everything. But how much do you attribute your the fact that you took Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as far as you did um, and applying it to your game? Like, I, I, I see so many times where I'm watching fights and, and guys have dominant positions, but they don't have that finishing skill. Is it, Why are people like – not immersing themselves and legitimizing themselves as much as they can in an art that can really, really be a difference maker? Jeez, you know, that's a good question. I think that, um, you know, sometimes guys get caught up in, in, in doing a lot of things uh, because there is so much to learn in mixed martial arts. Um, but also you kind of have to it, – it's hard, right, because you want to get better at your weaknesses, but you also have to understand who you are and what you're good at and how you match up against guys. And, um, I think in general, in general, um, people stop being a student of the game. And I think that when you start to think that you have a certain thing figured out, um, it, it, it you, you stop learning. And, and I think that, um, the deeper you go, the deeper you go, it, it, it's never ending. And, and I think that, um, the more you can be a student and really look into ways to get better and improve and you know, uh, understand jujitsu and understand positions, um, it, it's going to help you so much more. Um, you know, you have your opportunity to finish the fight. It could go away in a second. And um, I, I think having the, having the ability to finish a fight, um, you know, is, uh, on the ground can be like your knockout punch, you know, uh, can be like your version of what Engano can do out there. So, yeah, you know, um, I, I think that's what it comes down to. And I think, you know, we're, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is still kind of young uh, in, in how we teach it and how we understand it. And, you know, I've actually started a YouTube uh, page where, where I'm teaching it and, and trying to help people understand it as much as much as possible. But, you know, we all can learn together and, and just, uh, you know, continually questioning and and uh, looking into ways to get better is the way to do it. Yeah, I mean just looking at Vicente Luque and what he did for a second there, I thought he was blowing an opportunity where maybe he should ground and pound because he really almost looked like he had Woodley hurt on his feet so uh, while standing. But then he went in there and then when he later explained just how much he's worked on it and, you know, he, he had the right uh, details in that choke, you know, locking up his legs and everything that he, that he went for it, you know, and, yeah. and a lot of other fighters wouldn't do that. And Woodley's no slouch, man. That guy used to sub a lot of guys in his, 
early part of his career. And of course, he's a decorated wrestler. So that was very, very impressive. But I figured you were a good guy to talk about this because you were one of those guys where they say, is he a, a black belt? Or is he a legit black belt? And you were a legit black belt, especially for MMA. And there's a difference. But that difference maker can be what got you to all these big fights. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate that. And I wish I, I could have been um, much better because I, I did have my weaknesses as well. Um, you know, obviously, there, there's the BJ Penn uh, submission uh, loss uh, that um, I, I didn't like too much. And, you know, for me, I remember before that camp and, and kind of prior to that, I didn't have a whole lot of guys really pushing me in that realm. Um, and you know, I wasn't as defensively sound as I could be. And that was a mistake of mine. And, and, you know, it, it got a little bit better as I went on and, and still I, I had my issues and, and, uh, it, it's just a constant search for, for how to get better. And, and, um, Vincente Luque, I thought looked, looked great on Saturday night. Um, you know, both on the feet and on the ground, uh, being a guy like, like a Tyron Woodley, who was as aggressive as he was on Saturday night was, was impressive. George, is it all right for me to ask a question? Because I'm just a scrub AYSO player, and I don't know. If, is that you know what? I, I didn't guess. mean it. I didn't mean it at you, goes. I was honestly just thinking of all the AYSO people that then go to high school and then go to college. But it was not. I was not. I don't hesitate to take a dig at my little brother, but on that one, it honestly wasn't. All right, all right. Well, let's, let's get on to a little bit of PFL here now, like. When you look at the PFL fighters, this is a different breed because this yeah. is something that you have to really prepare for and really condition yourself to be successful in it. So what I wanted to ask you was, Kenny, if, you, if you're looking for one intangible in a fighter that can survive this type of season, putting their body through camp after camp, or kind of, kind of being in one long camp, what is that one intangible that you would say they need to have if they're going to compete here in the PFL? Geez, you know, I, I think I would probably have a better answer for you at, at the end of the season because this is still new to me. You know, like I, I think about this. How how would I train for this season? Um, I think in some ways it's easier in that you, you kind of have your schedule laid out for you, assuming you uh, win each and every fight. You know when you're going to fight. You know how to kind of manage that a little bit. Um, but, you know. I think there's so much to manage. First of all, you got to make sure your weight's on point the whole time. Uh, your focus has to be there throughout the season. Um, you know, knowing uh, knowing and understanding who you're going to go against, how to pace yourself uh, as far as your training, and how to uh, tone it down and ramp it up as you go uh, fight to fight. Um, th there's it, it really is a tremendous balancing act. But I guess if I had to pick one thing, I would say just focus. You know, you could have an awesome performance or get an easy matchup or get a tough matchup uh, and, and maybe lose confidence or gain too much confidence. The key is really staying as even keeled as possible, being as stoic as possible um, and, and just keeping that focus throughout the season and understanding that, you know, you got to take it one fight at a time um, and not look too far ahead. Um, and, and not stay in the past too much either, man. It, it, it really is going to be interesting. You know, from my perspective, I haven't had to deal with anything like that. So um, it, it, it's an interesting thing. It kind of brings the martial arts aspect back to it, you know, with, with, go, with those who have competed in jujitsu tournaments or karate tournaments or wrestling tournaments, you know, having to pace yourself for those, you know, for that day or for the, that weekend or uh, for that season uh, is, is a different beast. Goes, I know you got more questions, but man, I just love the reinforcement from Ken Flo describing how what's, what happens in the PFL is unlike other promotions and basically compartmentalized a lot in the fact that this is a season, you know, and it's pretty cool that the fighters have had, you know, well, take out 2020, but you have your off season and then you gear up and you, the way you were describing it, Kenny, it's the same way somebody going to um, spring training for baseball, you know, right. or later on this year, how they start doing their, uh, their weightlifting and conditioning to prepare for football and exhibition. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be unique to see how many fighters can maybe apply a little bit of that that you get in traditional sports that, that have seasons and then bring it over to here. It seems like Palmer and Schulte and a few of those guys have kind of figured it out because they're back-to-back -back totally. guys. 
let's see how the new guys like Verdum and Pettis and 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 the rest of the cats, uh, you know, how they deal with it. Absolutely, man. You know, uh, matchups matter. And I think that, you know, let's say I, I know I have a difficult matchup for my, you know, my first round and I go all out in that fight and it turns out I'm, I'm messed up for a couple months. Well, guess what? Now I'm compromised for my next fight. So I think, you know, not only does the win matter, but the way that you win and the approach uh, in it is just as important. That's exactly what I wanted to ask you about was yeah. fighting, going all out fighting in a particular style. You know, even if we go back to the ultimate fighter, right? When you went in there, you knew that there was the opportunity to do this multiple times. And I think outside looking in, a lot of us will say, well, you got to fight a certain way to maybe conserve yourself because you might have to go right back in there. But at the end of the day, when they lock that door, is that is that just easier to say to fight a certain way? At some point, do you just, does the fighter and you come out and there's just no stopping you? Yeah, listen, I, I think that you want to try to avoid that the best that you can. You know, we, we'd like to think that, hey, I got the right approach and this is how I'm going to fight. But sometimes, um, you know, uh, extreme situations call for extreme measures and, and you got to do what you got to do at the end of the day, end of the day to get the win. Uh, and it's all dependent on what kind of skills you have and how you match up against, you know, B fighter, C fighter, D fighter. So, um, those are all things that need to be managed appropriately, both by the fighter and the coaches. So uh, it, it's a really unique thing. Uh, and, and I'm looking forward to kind of learning about that process as much as possible, um, you know, from these guys and, and kind of listening to Sean O'Connell and Randy Couture and, and, and their experience, uh, uh, their experience in, in calling the fights. And of course, Sean O'Connell has competed in and become a PFL champion. So, um, it, it, it's fascinating. Is there a particular division that you can point to where I know you're going to be jazzed for every fight every night, but maybe you, uh, brush up that suit a little bit more that day or have an extra cup of coffee. Cause you know, this division is going to bring it. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I, I think the PFL's welterweight division is pretty bananas. Uh, th there's a ton of good guys, uh, in, in that, in that division, Magomed, uh, Magomed carry off. Uh, is someone who kind of reminds me of a Fedor in his prime back in the day. He, he probably is even better on the ground in regards to uh, his positioning and his submission skills. Um, he His ground and pound is brutal. He's very like loose on the feet, throws a lot of big shots, um, and just knows how to put it all together, man. Um, of course, you have Rory McDonald, um, who is very experienced, very good, very big for the division. Uh, is dangerous everywhere. He's going to be motivated here to to get the money and get the belt. Um, and and of course the champ, um, you know, Brada boy, uh, Ray Cooper, um, who who is an absolute savage. Comes from that wrestling background. Uh, you know, already has a ton of experience in the PFL. He has a winning recipe now, um, and he's going to be tough to deal with. So there's a bunch of other guys um, that have a lot of experience coming into this, and um, uh, I'm really curious to see how it all plays out. Yeah, no doubt. And um, by the way, I've always wanted to ask you this one, too, because we've mentioned the Ultimate Fighter a few times. Ghost just brought it up in his last question. What did those extra um, events or uh, challenges do to your body in addition to the weight, the, you know, the, the multiple weight losses and then the, the killers that you that you wound up being against? You know, because at the time we're like, well, who's this guy? Who's that guy? Whatever. Yeah. Um, but obviously, a, a lot of them, you know, had great, great careers, just like yourself. But what, what did those extra challenges do to you guys that they implemented in the first couple seasons? This might surprise you guys and everybody listening uh, at home, but I wasn't so physically gifted. I know, I know it's crazy. <laughs> I, you know, the, the physique may have thrown you guys off, but um, yeah, you know, I, there, there were guys that were just so physically fit and strong and big. You know, I was fighting at 185 pounds, back then. So I was like a chubby 182 pounds or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, you look at, you know the Josh Koscheck's and the Chris Liebens and, you know, all these other guys that were just, uh, horses out there. 
uh, you know, we had to, we had to lift a bunch of weight and run and do all these other things. And I was like, so bad at all those things. And I was okay. I was, I was a decent athlete. I didn't really get tired necessarily, but like pushing weight and holding weight and all that stuff was just such a pain in the ass. Like, I know like the other guys who, who are good at that didn't like it. So you can imagine me. I was like, eh, I didn't love it. I, I, I did my, I did my best. I, I, I definitely worked hard. Uh, but yeah, it was kind of, it was tough because that was on the backdrop of training, you know, uh, seven days a week. I think, I don't think we really had a day off. I, I don't remember correctly, but I think we were training two times a day, seven days a week. And I was used to training a lot, but not to the capacity of like doing strength and conditioning and all that stuff. That stuff uh, really beat up my body. I, my, my, I was just not used to that, to that extent. So um, I was sore every freaking day. And, you know, I had staff at one point and, you know, it was, it was, it was interesting, man. And and we were there for two months, you know, um, I, I was there for two months anyway. So I, I was ready. I was ready for it to be over by the end, man. Man, that's hilarious. And it's in, interesting now that 16 years later, I guess you and Couture will reunite in that he'll be yes. part of the team with you. I'm sure you're looking forward to that. He's very, very polished. Sean yeah. O'Connell, unique in that he's the play-by-play -play guy, but he's right. got experience fighting, and he's also got experience in the PFL. So what a great team that they've uh, put together for this season. How, how happy are you to do that? Did you have to go through a tryout, or did you just get a call? Um, because I think they got themselves a, you know, a, a great you know, compliment to the team that they already had in, in Sean and, and Randy. Th thanks so much, man. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really excited to work with Sean and Randy. It's been a while since I've seen Randy. I think I saw him at the uh, Ultimate Fighter reunion uh, from a few years ago. But um, yeah, I mean, and those guys have so much insight and so much experience. So I'm really looking forward to working with them. Um, and as far as the whole process, you know, it, it really just came down to a phone call. You know, I was approached um, a little while ago and uh, I was proposed the idea. And of course, you know, the, the pandemic hit. So that kind of pushed everything back a little bit. Um, and I was happy that I got the call back and, um, you know, told me that they were, they were ready and prepared to do, um, the 2021 season. And, um, I, I feel blessed to be a part of it, man. I, I'm looking forward to seeing all the great fights and to see exactly how each of the divisions play out. I know fans are wondering this and I'm a fan and I'm wondering it too, but, um, when the tenure with Fox was over and they moved over to ESPN, a lot of the people came over. Um, you didn't, but yeah. what's weird is they thought highly of you in that they featured you as, I saw you as a host, you know, on Fox with you and Shale in the host role. Right. I saw you as a, as an analyst role as well. And then you and Anik were the, you know, OGs of um, like kind of like the second team that they had created mm. uh, as far as, you know, color commentator. I remember you breaking down fights with Damon Martin and Jeff Kane on MMA Weekly. And then, of course, Anik and Florian uh, is one of the top podcasts out there. But are you did you leave on good terms with the UFC? Are you on good terms with the UFC? And I, is there an explanation for that or, or is that personal? You know, you tell us. No, you know, I wish I had some kind of information to give you guys. You know, I, it was funny, you know, when I stopped, when I wasn't being used as much, I, I remember reaching out to the UFC, my manager would reach out to the UFC and whether it was on phone or text or email, uh, you know, all of those different forms were utilized and it was always like, oh no, you know, we're just, we're trying things different and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we're, we're, we'll get back to you and, you know, we'll, we'll call you, <laughs> you know, it was like kind of one of those things. Brendan Schaub is funny. He was like, you got phased out like Milton in office space. You know, it was like, it was kind of like, it was kind of like that. It was, I don't know. Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't have an answer for you of why they decided to go a different route. Um, you know, I, I hope uh, they're happy with the way things are going with with the different announcers that that they've been using and broadcasters. Um, you know, I, I get that question very often from fans and different people. And um, yeah, I, I would love to just kind of get an answer of like, hey, Kenny, you know, we decide not to use you because of this or that. Um, you know, I, I have been told that Dana White was angry at me for some reason. I I don't know. I never received a phone call from him on anything. I, I don't know. I, I really wish I had it. Uh, had an answer for you, man. 
Yeah, and I even left out, I remember the show, I think it was called MMA Live. I mean, you and Molly and John and right. uh, Franklin McNeil, um, yes. you guys, you know, definitely putting a spotlight on the UFC back then when ESPN, um, you know, wasn't really looking much at the UFC. Heck, I even got to give you credit. I think you put the skinny suit uh, on the map. <laughs> And the hair and everything, and all the other fighters started showing up. DC, I hope, I wish he wouldn't have done it, but uh, <laughs> all the other guys started coming in with the fitted suits and everything. Like you had to style your way ahead of your time. I, I think it's oh it's my, I think, that's well, too well, funny, my dude. Probably assisted in that, but seriously, man, like uh, <laughs> you did some good work, man, and, and I'm I'm just glad you're somewhere, you know. And I think Thank PFL you. is quality I, and ESPN too with a great team. So we're always gonna in your corner and rooting for you. Um, and I guess just it was a, a roundabout way of saying we missed you. You should be in these spots. I appreciate that. Thank you, man. Yeah, you know, it's it's been a while. And, and of course, you guys were uh, part of those OGs that I used to talk to regularly and break down fights with. And, and all those repetitions and all those things really help uh, and help me. Uh, for a career that I didn't know I would I would be a part of later on. So, yeah, I think it was, you know, 2007, um, maybe 2007, 2008, where I started working for ESPN. And that was kind of the first mainstream outlet for for mixed martial arts back in the day, I guess you could say one one of the first, certainly. And uh, being there with John Anik and Molly Karam. And yeah, it, it was it was wild times, man. It was cool. And, and um, yeah, so I, I've I've you know, was a part of the UFC for a long time and, and help, help them, um, in, in a lot of different areas. I, I don't really have any regrets. I, I, I try to look forward and, and try to make the best out of a situation. And I'm, I'm just glad to, you know, that I'm at the point where I'm at right now and having a lot of fun and get a chance to call fights now this year with the PFL and, and doing the Anakin Florian podcast with John. And, um, I, I still get my fix, which is nice. Well, you definitely deserve it, man. Um, Thanks. Thank you so much for coming back on with us here. And, and I, you know, we talked a little bit about the card with um, Sean O'Connell early on. Um, but for now, I guess we'll leave this here. But we'd like to include you in a rotation of previewing these upcoming cards as well. Um, you know, they, they're going to have a, a nice run to start things off on April 23rd on a Friday. Then they, they regress to Thursday night, which I really, really like, especially uh, in the spring and summer unopposed with NFL. I want a big spotlight on you guys. I think they do a great job with the production, so we can't wait to see it. Um, but yeah, man, Schulte, Pettis, um, you know, Bubba Jenkins, Lance Palmer, like, you know, now these divisions are really, really stacked, and it's going to be an interesting season in PFL. And again, we're glad to, to see you uh, part of the team. No doubt. Thank you guys so much. I'm, I'm happy to come on again.